Ooh. All right, we're back. And we are here on HETV to continue our series on chronic GI. Don't forget that I already have acute GI in the playlist. This is chronic GI. And right now we're moving on. We did basics of digestion, two parts. Then we did dumping syndrome and weight loss surgery. Now we're moving on to some problems that everybody kind of knows a little bit about. Gallbladder disease. When your gallbladder has stones in it, they hurt. And it's called cholecystitis, right? It's a $4 word, but here it is. It's cholecystitis, inflammation of the gallbladder. And so when you have inflammation of the gallbladder, that really hurts. And typically what you see in that patient is that if you ask them, they would probably tell you for the last few months, they feel some kind of way after they eat. This particular day that they visited your ER, they had a very fatty meal. Mm, let me tell you what my students told me got them in the ER. Because I always ask students in my class, have you ever had gallbladder disease? And inevitably I find at least three or four that did. My favorite stories are the waffle fries and the waffle, um, what do they call that? The elephant ears at Cedar Point. So one of my students ate an elephant ear at Cedar Point. She was pregnant. That'll play a issue, that'll play a role later. Somebody else had a uh, elephant fry, no, waffle fries from where was that at? I thought it was Chick-fil-A. Somebody else had, because they was like on the same BS that I be on from time to time. They went to Rally's, honey, my favorite, and got loaded fries. I'm talking about chili on the fries, ranch on the fries, everything on the fries, cheese on the fries, the fries is the fries, or the fries is fried. And I mean, you know, just crazy. And then somebody else. It was sad because it's my other favorite place to go. I guess I better watch it, huh? Popeye's chicken. Mmm, chap. So we got all of those fatty meals sending this patient into living hell. What does it feel like? Well, the patient gets this right-sided pain. You already knew that because we did glass in the first video. Gallbladder, liver, well, actually liver, gallbladder, but we'll do it this way. Gallbladder, liver, appendix, stomach, the sigmoid colon, or shit, right? Do it again. Just, just in case you missed that, I'll do it slower. Glass, gallbladder, liver, right upper quadrant. Appendix, right lower quadrant. Stomach and spleen, left upper quadrant, shit, or sigmoid colon, left quadrant lower quadrant. Now that you know, you know this patient is going to have a lot of pain in the right upper quadrant because that's what a freaking gallbladder is. Not only are they going to have severe pain, they're going to have, here we go, N, V, and D. Remember that? Nausea, vomiting, maybe not diarrhea, but it sounded cute to start with, but definitely nausea and vomiting. They will be sweating because they're stressed, and so this doesn't feel good. This hurts, and it's horrible. They will even have, please make sure you write this down, a positive Murphy sign. It means that if you lay the patient on their back and you feel in their intercostal space on the right hand side in between the ribs and you tell them to take a deep breath, they'll stop breathing because it hurts so bad. That's a positive Murphy sign. This patient will definitely have a positive Murphy sign. They will be bloated. Their belly will be distended. They will have lots of what we call eructation. Don't let that word scare you. That's just burping, honey. They will have flatulence. What is that? Farting. They will also have um, dyspepsia. Mm, what is that? Heartburn. Everything you could think of, they're going to have this Popeye's chicken, these loaded fries at rallies, this uh, elephant ear at Cedar Point, all this fatty foods that I love. They're going to have a problem. Now, what is the problem? Well, now we got to go back to the second basics of digestion video. And we have to remember that we said when you eat something with fat in it, the duodenum or the small intestine sends a message to the gallbladder to contract and squeeze out or secrete bile so it can help emulsify and melt the fat. The problem is if the gallbladder has gall stones inside of it, then when it contracts and tries to squeeze out some bile to help with the fat, 
it can squeeze out a stone and it can get stuck in the cystic duct. If it gets stuck in that little duct there, which is the duct coming off the gallbladder going down into the small intestine, not the common bile duct, that's a whole nother problem. This is a cystic duct, just right off the gallbladder trying to come out. If that little gallstone gets stuck there, that's when you start having this pain and inflammation and feeling like crap and let me get to a hospital and oh my God and yada, yada, yada. Now, it depends on how severe this is. It can be so severe, and this is rare, gall, gall, uh, gallbladder disease is not rare, it's common. Cholecystitis is not rare, it's common. Gallstones is not rare, it's common. But it's really rare for you to have cholecystitis or gallbladder disease and the stone, instead of being stuck in the cystic duct, get stuck in the common bile duct. O-M-G. If it gets stuck in the common bile duct, I don't know if you remember the gangsters. The gangsters was the gallbladder, the liver, and the pancreas, and they hang together no matter what, and they so cool, they share the same common bile duct. So if a stone gets stuck there, you're blocking the liver. You're blocking the gallbladder, which is a goner. You know that was kind of just... You knew that already. But then did you know they're blocking the pancreas? When you do that, all hell breaks loose. Because what I'm trying to tell you is even though it's rare, it's very, very often deadly. And that is if a gallstone gets stuck in the common bile duct and causes pancreatitis, pancreatitis, as you know, is not a chronic issue. It's an acute deadly issue. So that's why you kind of lightweight care about the cholecystitis patient. And there's ways to know whether or not it's stuck in what duct, right? Because you're smart, you know there's some ways to know. So let's think about what if. Let's do the what if. What if the gallstone is stuck in the common bile duct? How will that look differently? Mm. First of all, the patient may be jaundice. Yellow, where, Shelly? Their eyes, yellow sclera. The patient may have clay colored stools because remember it was the bile and bilirubin that gave the stool the color. The patient may have dark and even foamy urine. The urine is dark because it has bile and bilirubin in it. The patient will have labs that look terrible. Those labs will look like high white blood count. The liver labs, the AST and the ALT will be really high. The bilirubin will be really high. This is all liver and pancreas and all this. Lipase will be super high because lipase is the number one pancreatitis lab. So you're gonna know if this is stuck in the common bile duct. And also remember that before you get this patient off to wherever they're going to get you know, diagnosed, you will have a little bit of information just based on how the patient's presenting because that kind of pain is much more severe and that patient is much more sicker. Their blood pressure is super low and everything else is super high. The temp, the pulse, the respirations, they're high. This is awful. Now, to figure all this out, we do an ultrasound. An ultrasound can easily see gallstones. It's kind of simple. And ultrasounds are nice because they're not a lot of radiation and they're kind of safe and we don't really think too much about them. They're just simple. Um, but if that doesn't figure it out for us or if we need a little bit more detailed studies or if we think it's in the pancreas, we're gonna do something called a HEDA scan. I'm gonna write that on the board because I, I really want you to know what I just said. HEDA scan. And a HEDA scan is a hepatobiliary immunodiactic scan. Yeah, you don't need to know that. All you need to know is that if the test spells this out, it's hepatobiliary immuno blah blah blah. Okay, that is how we do it. Now, so you know what hepato means. It means liver. Biliary means all the ducts. So you'll be okay with that. And so we might do something called a HEDA scan if we think perhaps that this is involving the pancreas. We could also do something that maybe could remove the stone and diagnose the patient. That would be called an ERCP, an endoscopic 
retrograde well let's see E R C ah coleangio pancreatography there I got it out no I'm gonna say it fast endoscopic retrograde coleangio pancreatography E R C P pain in your ass you better believe it because it will be spelled all the way out but because you are the bomb.com you're not gonna get your little panties in a bunch and your drawers in a crunch because you're gonna remember that I said endoscopic which is just an endoscopy then you got the R which is retrograde which is looking back then you got the coleangio blah 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 cole is gallbladder and then you have the pancreatography looking at the pancreas see stop fussing you got this e r c p okay so these are the three tests involved in looking at a patient with gallbladder disease ultrasound heat -a scan e r c p now what are we doing for this patient as a nurse because those scans are cute but you don't do scans what are you doing as a nurse up uh, same shit, different day y'all know you forgot didn't you I-V-N-G, Foley, surgery, and if needed, antibiotics and electrolyte replacement. Now, so let's double it up a little bit. Patient comes in with all this hot ass mess. Immediately, you're gonna make them NPO. You might need an NG depending on how bad this is and if it's stuck in the common bile duct and all the rest of the goes with it. You definitely will need those IVs. One will be fine, maybe two if your doctor wants it, but one for sure. You might need a Foley if we're trying to plan gallbladder surgery, but you don't need a Foley if it's a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And we do a lot of laparoscopic cholecystectomies lately. That's mm, pretty much 90% of the way we take a gallbladder out. We take it out through a laparoscopic surgery. So you may not need that Foley after all, but you got the gist of it. You know this is what we do for GI. And because we said that all GI is dirty, if this patient, and they might, if this cholecystitis itis patient has a fever and chills and high white blood count and everything that goes with that, we might actually have to do some antibiotics. If the patient has been Let's just say they're a man. Oh, I'm not sexist. I love men, honey. But I'm saying men approach things very differently. They don't go to the hospital. They don't complain. They don't say nothing. They wait to the last minute when they're on death's door to say something. If the man has been throwing up for days and just not really talking about it, then he's lost a lot of electrolytes, and you can see how we might have to do electrolyte replacement. There you go. You got it. It's all GI. Now, I do want to say some things to you about this patient's um, about this patient's uh, management right you know that while we're in PO it's kind of like easy does it like you ain't doing nothing you're just letting the belly rest but this patient may get away without surgery in fact I'm gonna tell you how it is my, my, my students are crazy I had an NCLEX review student who wanted to get through NCLEX first she had a gallbladder attack. She went to the hospital. They told her, okay, we're going to take your gallbladder out. She's like, oh, no, you're not. Not so fast. You're not taking it out because I got a test next week. I'm going to pass that test first, and then I'll come back and see y'all. Now, she's crazy, but it's an example of how cholecystitis is not an emergency. She left that hospital. She made sure she didn't eat anything with fat in it at all. Matter of fact, she did something I could never do, which is eat rice every day. No pepper, nothing. No butter, nothing. No gravy, nothing. I don't even like rice, but if I did, I'd have to put all that salt, pepper, gravy, everything on it, honey, or some butter and sugar or something. But she didn't eat nothing but rice until that test she took out of my class was passed. And then she called herself going to show up at that same house. I'm talking, I'm ready for my gallbladder to be taken out. That's like, girlfriend, that ain't how we do things. So they had to schedule her and she's fine. But it's a point I'm making so you know it's not who you see first. Now, I want you to stay with me for a minute because let's say that you are not my student who decided to eat rice for God knows how long. And that this is a patient, you are the patient who needs to have surgery. First of all, I do want to point out who's at risk for the gallbladder disease. We call it eight F's. Sounds crazy. Yeah, eight F's. Are you with me? Fat or fluffy, depending on how you want to say it. So that's the first F. 
the patient's fat or fluffy. The second F is the patient is female. The third F is that the patient is 40. So they're not 10, 15, or 20. No, they're usually about 40-ish, maybe 50-ish. Or if they're not that, then fetus. Well, what's fetus? Pregnant. Yeah, they're pregnant. Gallbladder disease in pregnancy is very common. Okay, so there you go. Now, what else? You said there was eight. Oh, I got eight. Fried foods, because it followed a fried food meal, like, you know, how that is. Then we have flatulence. So the patient was passing gas one way or the other, either through the ruta or the tuta. So how many we got? We got six. All right, let's find some more. Oh, fair-skinned, which means that Caucasians and lighter complected people tend to have this gallbladder disease. Not the dark-skinned people can't, they just don't tend to be the one to have it. And then we call it fertile. Fertile means you're of the age where you might be taking birth control pills. Birth control pills can kind of increase your risk of a little gallbladder disease, if you know what I mean. And sometimes we add another one and we call it five kids, because the more kids you've had, the more likely you are to get gallbladder disease. Now, what has all of that got in common? Some of it, not all of it, a few of it though, the female, the fat, the birth control pills, the fetus, which means pregnant, those four have something in common, and that would be estrogen. Estrogen is stored in fat cells. So those are the risk factors that we have for gallbladder disease. Now let's try to take care of our fat, fluffy, 40, fetus, heaven, whatever person. Let's go on ahead and schedule them for surgery. This laparoscopic cholecystectomy, which is a handout in your actual packet, this is a surgery where we take something like, and give me a minute, because I'm going to go over here and get a pencil or a pen or whatever. Here it is. I got it. Here I come, y'all. When we do laparoscopic surgery, we take instruments no bigger than this pen in diameter. You see it? You got it? Okay. And we poke holes in your belly. It's nice because we used to, I know this sounds crazy, Just try to hang out with your girl. Here I go. Pray that I don't fall. We used to jackknife your body over an OR table and cut you from here all the way to the back and take out your gallbladder. Whew, thank God for technology. Now we poke a few holes in you. Sometimes we poke a hole at the top of the pubic bone, at the bottom of the belly button, over to the side a couple places, or over to that side, whatever. We poke holes with this instrument that's no bigger than this. We use those holes to blow your belly up with nitrous oxide. We also look at those holes through a light with a really good light. We can see everything inside of there. And we manipulate you in such a way to get your gallbladder out. Now what happens after the gallbladder surgery or the laparoscopic cholecystectomy? Well, you've got a few things to remember. Number one, it's a nice simple recovery. When we jackknifed your crazy behind and opened you up and cracked your, cracked your little butt over the OR table, you are going to take six to eight weeks to recover. When we do this type of surgery, two to three days. When we jackknifed your body, you had a very real risk of hemorrhage. When we do laparoscopic surgery, you lose very little blood. When we jackknifed your butt over the OR table, we had several dressing changes in a day three times a shift at least because you were bleeding and we had to change it. You're bleeding, we had to change it. You're leaking fluid, we had to change it. You're leaking bile, we had to change it. Uh, no, we put band-aids over your little spots now. Okay, so you good. When we jackknifed your body up over the OR table and cut you from here to here, you used to get pneumonia every single time. Why, Shelly? Well, because if you do, and listen to me please, if you do an open cholecystectomy, which was jackknifing your body over the OR table, cutting you from here to here, if I did that surgery to you, one thing you ain't gonna wanna do is this. <gasps> You are not going to want to cough and deep breathe because every time you, <gasps> this hurts like hell and you'd rather not go there. So what do you do? You tend to shallowly breathe. You tend to breathe very low. You don't cough at all and all that fluid and gunk stays in your lungs, gets infected, and then you get pneumonia. You don't want to use the incentive spirometer. And don't forget what we taught you about incentive spirometer. Suck the balls. That'll hit you Tuesday. That's just a little gadget. And you know what it is. Where is it? I got one around here somewhere. Here it is. I'll be back. Hold on. Hold your pantyhose. Here we go. 
You have to have the patient take the mouthpiece and you inhale. You tell them to suck in, suck the balls. There's the ball, suck the balls. Suck the balls and hold the ball up. It's not enough to get the ball to go up. No, you've got to keep it up. That's not easy. Okay, that's going to clear the patient's lungs. So yeah, you've got a few things as a nurse to do with any surgical patient, you knew that. Now one more, well, a few more things real quick though, is when a patient has had a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, they may have pain on the right hand side that radiates to their shoulder. If that's the case, you've got to remember that this is from the, the carbon monoxide that we used, the carbon dioxide that we used to blow the stomach up, the nitrous gases and things that we use to blow the stomach up. And what you've got to do is position the patient on their side with their knees up to get those gases to come out of the body. Also, early ambulation for this patient. More, the more you get the patient up, the more the gas pains, which can be sharp as a knife, the more the gas pains will work themselves right up out of the patient. This is not that bad a recovery. Now, I do wanna say a few things uh, uh, before I go. Let me just make sure that I give you a few little tips on one more thing. This patient with this open cholecystectomy, your highest priority is pain relief versus the laparoscopic cholecystectomy where your highest priority is just getting the patient to walk. So that's the big deal. Now with this other patient with this whole laparoscopic cholecystectomy, they may complain a lot about that pain. Just remember what I said right side pain radiating to the shoulder is common after this laparoscopic surgery have them turn on their left with their knees up to their chest and that will relieve that pain but you should be okay i think i covered everything deuces